Aloha and welcome to another episode of Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. I'm your co-host Matt Johnson and unfortunately, uh, I know most of you are hoping to see Justine Espirito. She's not here with us today, she'll be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, apologize for the hiatus that we took, um, but thank you James McKay for uh, jumping in and hope you all enjoyed uh, listening to him. Uh, as always, you can find us here uh, on Think Tech uh, every Thursday at 4 p.m. And we're talking to Hawaii's uh, movers and shakers in our local food economy. So talking to farmers, uh, talking to restaurateurs, and today we're talking to a writer, journalist, and also a chef. Uh, with us today is Martha Chang. But just before we get into that, if you want to join the conversation, you can tweet us at, at thinktechhi. And after the show, you can see us up on YouTube at thinktechhawaii.com. Um, so yeah, our guest today is Martha Cheng. Uh, she is a writer, a chef, um, and also recently just came back from a conference, a biannual conference in Italy, uh, which is the Terra Madre Salon del Gusto. Uh, so we'll be talking about um, that trip as well. So Martha, thanks so much for uh, joining me on the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, so uh, you and I met not too long ago, and uh, so you have like one of those really interesting past, a lot of different things, and you're one of those people that is well known in the local food economy of Hawaii, uh, especially in the restaurant industry. Um, can you talk a little bit about what kind of got you involved in liking food so much? Uh, <laughs> does it everybody? <laughs> 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 I mean, I think it was partly, I'm, my parents are from Taiwan, they're Taiwanese immigrants, okay. and so Taiwan is just a food obsessed culture. Like mm. you always talk about your next meal during your meal, you talk oh, about wow. what you ate before, and just, um, the common greeting is like, have you eaten yet? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it's just totally ingrained in, I think, my psyche. Mm. But I don't think I ever really, you know, thought about it as like, it didn't really come into my consciousness, I think, until I was in the Peace Corps. Okay. Yeah, so like... Um, and you were in St. Vincent? I was in St. Vincent, okay. yeah. In the Caribbean? In the Caribbean. Mm. And there's just, I didn't have a lot of, a lot of things to connect with people on, so I was really struggling on developing a community mm. until one day I think someone just invited me to make a cake with her and I was like all of a sudden it was like we had this common language nice. um, yeah so that's just what I found that I could connect with people on now in St. Vincent was there any similarities to Taiwan where was food I mean I imagine food was very important in their culture as well um not to the like obsessive degree that Taiwan <laughs> is like yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Taiwanese are Taiwanese take it to that next level yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's like the Olympics of food there or something. <laughs> Olympics yeah. Of eating. yeah. And I think it's also, you know, because it's a little bit more well off. So St. Vincent, no, it was much mm. more of a um it was much more of just you you eat to survive. But mm -hmm. I mean, but every culture, even if you eat to survive, we all have opinions about our food, right? right, 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 right. <laughs> Everyone knows if they like a cake or they don't. They yeah, want to tell you and about let it. You know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. And so, so right now you're currently the editor of Hawaii Farm and Food Magazine. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the, the magazine, because it's a new mag new publication, started in 2015. Um, yes, relatively new, though I think it, it was in the iteration before. It was, it was like re reincarnated Oh, right okay, now. yeah. Yeah, so it's the Hawaii Farm Bureau Magazine, and basically we just tell stories about um, some of the farmers on Hawaii, some of their challenges, um, and obstacles and what they do to make it in Hawaii. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then before that, you were the food editor with Honolulu Magazine. Yes. Yeah. And that's uh, some interesting stories from there because part of your assignment was being a food critic. Yeah. And that was just n totally <laughs> my accident. Yeah. yeah, yeah <laughs> when yeah, yeah, I yeah. started um, writing about food, I just, I wanted to stay as far away from restaurant criticism as I could because I just didn't want to get involved with that. I didn't want to yeah. get involved with like, you know, closing down a business if that, if I didn't like it or something or, and also just. Yeah, the, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's so personal. I feel like food right. is so personal. Like, yeah. I don't think it, it, something should rely on my experience alone yeah. um, or someone should not draw a conclusion on a place based on my Right, like right off a place just because Martha Chang doesn't like it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I'm just one person with a very specific um, Palette. upbringing. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but what else were you doing at Honolulu Magazine then? Um, so basically writing about 
Hawaii's food culture from all these different angles. So okay. I think one of my favorite, uh, some of the favorite things that I did at the magazine were these packages called like the Everything Guide to X. So the first one we did was Japanese food okay. in Honolulu yeah. um, because Jap Japanese restaurants are like the predominant restaurants in, yeah. in in Hawaii and there's like there's some it's interesting because there's some that are very traditional Japanese and mm. then there's some that are this weird local mashup that only exists in Hawaii okay. and the diversity within Japanese food is just so fascinating yeah. um, so there was that we did um, everything guide to ahi so like kind of Neat. what it's like to be on a long line boat okay. um, people who are trying to raise ahi and try to farm ahi um, which has yeah. been extremely pertinent lately because there's been articles coming out talking about some of the really uh, horrendous conditions for the fishing industry, for actually people working on the boats. There's yeah. been a lot of conversation about that lately. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting. Um, I was having a conversation with a friend recently and we're like, not to be, <laughs> I think this says more about us, but I guess we're just so cynical is like, I thought everyone knew about this already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and she was talking about, there was a recent New York Magazine, they were talking about basically, if you look at everything in our food supply, there's nothing that's, that's untainted. Right, right, um, right. And I think it's terrible that then our attitude is like, well, this is the way it is, versus like, what, okay, so what are we going to do about it? We need to make it? some immediate changes. Yeah. Or also, I wonder what it looks like. So what it looks like if you were to actually pay everyone well, mm -hmm. if you were to have... Um, environmentally clean food like what would that look like how much would it cost what yeah. sacrifices would we have to make for that yeah and, and I think that's bring up a good point like people that you know are kind of working in the industry like pretty much everybody we have on the show here mm -hmm. I mean we're getting involved and we understand and it is interesting when you talk to groups outside of I guess the the choir um, and yeah, sometimes it is kind of a kick saying, oh yeah, there's still a lot of misinformation. There's really only a small group of people that are really paying attention and, mm -hmm. and, and trying to understand that. So I think people like you that are writing about it and, and using some of these uh, larger, more well-read uh, medias is, is so important. Um, so so I, I kind of want to, because there's so many different facets to it, I kind of want to pull out, I don't want to forget anything before we <laughs> dive too deep on any one subject. But so then even before you were at Hello Magazine, I mean, you're, you're a, a chef as well. Talk a little bit about, about that experience and, and did that start with the, the cake that you, you baked in <laughs> St. Vincent or um, where did that come from? It started with me begging a lot of bakeries in the Bay Area to take me on as like a apprentice or something to teach me. Okay. So I finally found a woman who was just starting a bakery and was like, Okay, let's see. <laughs> yeah. So I started baking in the Bay Area, and mm -hmm. then when I moved to Hawaii, I started as a line cook at Alan Wong's. Like, wow. So I, I mean, I, I still love pastry, but I was just eating way too much cake. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was like, I need to move into something healthier. Yeah. To the yeah. savory side. Nice. So yeah, I loved. Okay, this is not true. When I first started, I hated it. <laughs> I'd come home crying that's every night. That's hard work. Yeah, and it's just, you're not used to it, right? And so... I, mean, I was just a busboy in a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> we're at the bottom of the totem pole, and yeah, we got beat down pretty badly. I don't but know. Maybe the people at the bottom of the totem pole have it worse. So, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think, I mean, any job in a restaurant, especially something like, I imagine, Al Wong's, I mean, it's, it's high-paced and, and probably very active. Yeah, it was just so stressful. Like, I was not used to that kind of... that that stress, that constant, like, you know, mm. everything has to come out at a certain time, everything has to be coordinated. Um, so it took me a long time to get into the rhythm of it, but mm. once I did, I loved it. Nice. <laughs> How long were you there? Two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then what, where did you go after that? After that, then I started freelance writing. That's when I, I was okay. kind of doing it on the side when I was working at the Pineapple Room, and then, mm. um, and then just kind of went for it after I left. Okay. So then I was uh, started at the Weekly, and then became the food editor at the Weekly. Okay. And that's kind of how it all started. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then, so what kind of things, like, how would you describe then your, so you started off doing, like, freelance writing, and you got involved with editor, and, I mean, your career has really progressed and been able to do different things, um, you know, well-known in the food community. What is it about your writing or, or the topics? I mean, what do you say is 
something that you like to focus on or, or is kind of your niche? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm just always looking for a good story, I guess. Okay. Just people that I'm interested in. I yeah. think it's mostly the people behind something that draws me to a story. Yeah. Yeah. And so, because you're talking to restaurants, but you're also, you work with, with farms. How about, mm -hmm. or some of their, some of the farms that you've worked with that you've been really interested in, or, or something that you didn't expect from when you first started the story? Hmm. I think about that one. <laughs> um, I think recently we did, actually, our current issue of the Hawaii Farm and Food Magazine is about local chocolate, okay. which I had written about for Honolulu Magazine too, but I thought um, that to me was interesting because at first when I heard about it, like that the ag, ag industry is super interested in locally grown chocolate, I was like, yeah. oh, it's just, I don't know, everyone's just looking for the next big thing, like right, the right. next Kona coffee mm. and the next pineapple, but it's just, you know, every time everyone floods a market, then the prices come down and then it just right. ends up being the same thing. Mm. Um, like it ends up going to the sugar or the pineapple route all over right. again. Right. But the more I talk to farmers about it, I realize I don't, I think it is different. And I think there is a lot of, there's a, I think there is a market for it. And I think it's exciting. I think it'll be really exciting to see how it unfolds because in this case, it's actually different, right? All the, all the techniques and all the chocolate right now is being grown in third world countries. Right. Um, and so it's kind of like Hawaii is now kind of taking all that knowledge and bringing it here and yeah. trying to create a more transparent product. Mm -hmm and hopefully better product yeah. that will command the price. So, I don't know, I think it's, I'll be curious to see how it works out. But well, I definitely am I'm curious to hear more from you on your uh, uh, perspective on that chocolate industry, because yeah, I've been hearing a lot about it as well. Um, but we do have to take a quick break, and then we're also gonna talk about your trip to Italy as well when we come back. So yeah, we'll be right back. Aloha, I am Reg Baker and I am the host of Business in Hawaii with Reg Baker. We broadcast live every Thursday from 2 to 2.30 in the Think Tech studios in downtown Honolulu. We highlight successful stories about businesses and individuals and learn their secrets to success. I hope you can join us on our next show on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Until then, aloha. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. back to Hawaii Food and Farmers Series. I'm your co-host, Matt Johnson. I uh, apologize, Justine can't make it with us today, but she'll be back in a couple of weeks. And uh, as always, you can join the conversation by tweeting in at thinktechhi. And uh, yeah, we're talking to Martha Cheng with us today, uh, who is a writer and also a chef. And um, just kind of talking about, Martha, you're, you're just, um, I'm curious to hear more about, you know, your perspectives of, as you see different parts of, um, the local food, local ag uh, industries. We're talking about chocolate, and that was um, the most recent um, cover story for Hawaii Farm and Food Magazine. Mm -hmm. So the a picture of the the cover right here. And so you're kind of talking about how you know you've seen other uh, crops become. You know, people get very excited about as the next big thing. But you were saying that you feel that there may actually be something with with chocolate. You want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think that the chocolate market is, as they say, there's just not enough chocolate being grown right mm. now. And one farmer I talked to, Will Lidgate Steelgrass Farms on Kauai, okay. like he said, Hawaii is the only, well, so it's the only place in the U.S. where you can grow chocolate, and so it's also the only place where there's no cultural barriers between the people who are making chocolate and the people who are growing chocolate. Okay. So, and that just opens up all these possibilities of kind of... So when you say, so you're talking about like the chocolatiers, the mm -hmm. ones who are you're taking the product and making it the final bar or whatnot, mm -hmm. and the actual growers, 
What do you mean by cultural barriers? Like what? what do you Because mean? right now, almost all the chocolate is being grown in Africa or mm. Central America or South America, mm -hmm. and then most of all the makers are in Europe and America. Oh, okay. So there's just this. There can be a cultural disconnect, and mm. there's also the distance. Yeah. You know, and so so Hawaii making Hawaii a, a cacao growing region opens up all these possibilities for the bean to bar makers to come here to really kind of influence and play with. The cacao, because it turns out, I mean, cacao is just like coffee or wine. Mm. There's so many points along the way where you can change the change final the flavor. flavor. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, so, so that's where there's more opportunity to be vertically integrated in Hawaii. Because I know right now, isn't most of the roasting of cacao doesn't that need to be shipped out to um, California? Isn't there a place in San Francisco where? That's the making. So okay, actually, making. yeah. So most cacao, when a bean to bar maker gets it, is already roasted and processed. Okay. And then they turn it into the bars. Okay. Um, and so I think the one you're thinking of is Dole. Dole used to grow the cacao, mm. uh, ferment it, and roast it and then ship it to Qatar and San Francisco yeah, to make yeah. into bars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Dole is starting to recognize that the vertical integration could okay. be very valuable. And so they're actually now keeping all their cacao and doing it in-house. So they're making all their own bars now. Okay. Yeah, so just in the past year, they started doing this. Oh, wow. Yeah. And right now, so there's this huge demand for the Hawaii chocolate, but there's not enough being grown. Not enough, like, locally grown cacao. Yeah, so a lot of the bean-to-bar makers here now ha are having to import their beans. So, like, the bean-to-bar makers are, like, I know, Madre Chocolate. Yeah, Who Manoa can? Chocolate. Manoa Chocolate. Yeah. Okay. Um, those are the two main ones. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, it's great to see. I mean, you need to have that, you know, the value-added part of it as well. Yeah. And I like how you say it, too, where there's more of that connection between the cacao grower, because I imagine probably cacao growers, if they're growing in a different... Uh, part of the world, especially if it's a developing part of the world, they're probably not getting the most fair prices for the work that they're doing. So if you have more of that integration and appreciation of the growers and then all the way to that final bar, then hopefully that makes for a more fair uh, industry. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, tying back into uh, Terra Madre mm -hmm. or the big theme of Terra Madre this well, yeah, year. Yeah, let's, let's go oh. into Terra Madre. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. That. Oh, you're good. <laughs> Do the, show. <laughs> um, the big theme of this year's conference was biodiversity. Okay. And um, okay, can you give a little background on the, the conference first? Yep. Yeah. So Teramaje is a biannual conference for Slow Food. Slow Food was an organization that started in Italy, um, kind of basically as a response to fast food. Okay. Uh, so a way to kind of reclaim our mm, some reclaim some of the cultural heritage. Uh, or culinary heritage, mm -hmm. um, and just celebrate the, they call it good, clean, and fair food. Mm -hmm. So environmentally clean and fair for the workers. Mm -hmm. um, so every other year, they kind of throw this uh, conference in Italy to bring together people around the world, a lot of farmers and chefs around the world, to talk about, um, <laughs> to talk about just what, what they're dealing with, some issues that they're dealing with. Um, and it's also, then they also have this huge market alongside, alongside the conference where they showcase just, just all food the from food. Everywhere. Yeah. You must have been just eating the whole time. <laughs> it was crazy. Well, it's funny though because so, it's, so this year was the first year they did it in the streets of, Tur of Turin. Yeah. So um, it was just, it like took over the city, just wow. all these stalls. But the funny thing is like, so 75% of it was Italian, so all the different regions of Italy and all the different little th products of all those regions in Italy. Yeah. Um, and then the rest was the rest of the world. Yeah. <laughs> so it was like <laughs> China had one booth, America had one booth. <laughs> like, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it was a little Italian centric, but yeah. M makes sense. Yeah, so. But so the main theme was biodiversity. And so I think we forget that in every everything we grow, there was and sometimes still is this huge biodiversity within each crop mm. and chocolate's one of those examples mm -hmm. like there isn't just one variety of cacao right. and so there's a guy on Maui who's who's toying with the idea of like making a single varietal cacao like the same way you would do a, a Cabernet Sauvignon or uh, a okay. Merlot yeah. um, and I just I just think that's interesting to like tease out all the different 
uh, varieties. Because I think that's also how you create like a more resilient um, oh, yeah. farm, right? Because I imagine, yeah, there might be some benefits to having that, that one bean that's, that's known for Hawaii, but like yeah. you're saying, having different flavors, different experiences. Mm -hmm. And also if you're the chocolatier, you may want to experiment with different things yeah. as well. Yeah, and I think it's beneficial for the farmer too because you kind of, you kind of, uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. no pun intended. Yeah. So like you're saying, yeah, it'd be more less resistant to disease if one variety mm -hmm. has an issue. You have other varieties to rely on. Yeah. Um, and that's similar to like we've had guys on here before talking about permaculture and, mm -hmm. and a very you know similar concept to that. Yeah. Um, now, who else was at the conference? Because there's always a, a good contingent from, from Hawaii. Who else was yeah. there this year? So this year was Madre Chocolate. Oh, perfect. <laughs> most, I swear he was the most popular person of yeah. all. Oh, I bet. <laughs> always like, that just always carries chocolate with him. Uh, so, right? yeah, Which yeah, is yeah. like better currency than money. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Charlie Rapoon from oh, cool. Raholi. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And it was super, it was fun. Like every time Charlie would see a farm, he'd kind of just like, he'd run out and like smell the dirt and yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> taste it just, just as he would all like. Up in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then there was some, there was, because um, we have a big Oahu contingent and then a big island contingent. Oh, okay. So there are some people from the big island as well. That seems like a good combination where you have you as kind of like the chef, writer, and then you have Nat, who's like the value added processor. Mm -hmm. You have Charlie, who's the grower. So it's a neat um, yeah, combination. Yeah. And yeah. then you guys, do you go through slow, because there's Slow Food Hawaii uh -huh. uh, organization as well. Do you kind of go through or with them, or is it just kind of going on your own? Oh, yeah. We go through Slow Food Oahu. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, Lori Carlson, who mm. is the president of Slow Food, actually, I think she's actually the governor of the whole region. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, she kind of organizes us and um, takes us under her wing. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, no, it sounds exciting. So what, what would you, and it was a week long conference or is um, it longer than that? Yeah, it was about, I think about a week, five days. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're eating, meeting people from all over the world, mm -hmm. trying different things. So what did you foresee or what do you see that anything you learned that could be a, adapted maybe in Hawaii as kind of strengthening our, um, food system here? Mm -hmm. I think the embracing the biodiversity was a big one. So a lot of the workshops were centered around that. So um, there was a Ugandan chef uh, mm. who prepared different ways of uh, cooking all these different bananas, which I thought was super relevant to us, yeah, right? Because yeah, yeah. we have so many varieties of bananas. Yeah. Um, and the, the chocolate, what was the other? I forget what the other workshops were. Um, Oh, but there was also um, Chinese farmers. I went to mm. a session where Chinese farmers were talking about some of the things they grow and how they're trying to grow differently from the large industrial machine. Yeah. Um, and there's tons of biodiversity in China, right? Oh, I think yeah. probably even more than Italy. It just doesn't, we don't hear about it as much yeah, yeah, because yeah. of translation issues. Yeah. Um, but so I guess that to me is the main thing is celebrating Hawaii's biodiversity mm. in the products that we make. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, my other, I don't know if this, is, this isn't anything concrete, but like uh, the thing I realized when I was in Italy, it's, you know, the Terra Madre is about celebrating all these like artisanal foods. Mm. But the fact is like, even Italy isn't immune to industrialization, right? right Everywhere right. you go, there's still like, there's still the McDonald's, there's still supermarkets. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone goes to the farmer's market. Um, and I think, I don't know, I, but I do think that for every, so there was this big talk at Terra Madre how we need to kind of stand up to the, um, stand up to the industrial, industrial companies. And so I do feel like so for every action, there's another reaction, right? Yeah. So as, as much as these industrial companies, the large industrial companies will grow, there will be more and more of the artisanal ones kind of in reaction or more of a preservation of them. Yeah. But I also don't think that it needs to be one or the other. Mm. Like I'm really interested in the space in between. Like how can you grow a, a, a larger company mm. um, that also cares about taste? and labor 
and environmental issues. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in that space in the middle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it seems like a very um, you know, practical way to look at it because you definitely have, you know, kind of sometimes described in Hawaii's food economy is almost like two camps. You have like kind of your old school ag guys or, you know, big farm, including like the seed core companies. And you have like these smaller permaculture type farms. And I think that's always kind of been my perspective too, is like these two camps need to figure out how we're all going to work together. Um, Cause it's already so hard as it is just to have any agriculture in a place like Hawaii, where there's so many pressures outside of the industry to just really kind of push it out of the way. Um, so I think that's a, a neat perspective. And, and also, too, with, with where you are um, at the Hawaii Farm Bureau uh, magazine. So mm -hmm. I think that's a neat position for someone like you to be in to kind of showcase some of these smaller artisanal type farms and, and restaurants mm -hmm. that are out there that maybe before haven't been associated with a group like the Farm Bureau. So I think that's, that's neat and it's you know, been exciting to see uh, you know, the different stories that have been in there. Yeah. And um, you know, I think it's a, a great resource. Um, so moving forward with, I guess, kind of your career or, or your um, different things that you're doing, mm -hmm. what do you see as kind of next for you and, or what you want to see have happen? Oh, uh, yeah. Don't ask me questions about the future. <laughs> I never know. I wouldn't know. I've guessed 10 years ago that I'd be here, or maybe even two years ago. <laughs> so. so how about with adding more cooking into your career? Are you, do you still <laughs> cook? Do you cook a lot at home? I cook some at home. Um, I did, I have a cookbook coming out in January. Oh, uh. <laughs> how did that slip by this past 29 minutes? Because it's not published let's yet. Do a, let's do a plug for that real quick, but I only have about a minute. Okay. Um, it's a, I'm sure you've heard, Poke Super Hot right now. Yep. So a publisher in New York uh, asked if I wanted to do a Poke cookbook. Cool. Which, to be honest, I was very hesitant about at first. Actually, I'm still very hesitant about it, mm. given some of the controversy around right, it right, right. now. Who knew Poke could be so controversial? I know, right? <laughs> yeah, sometimes we can bring it together, but also it's like, very yeah. So unfortunately we have to wrap it up there. Thank you so much Martha and as always come back every Thursday and we will see you next week. Aloha.